Welcome back to the final part of Lecture 6. What we're going to do this lecture is examine one final deformation that we can subject a Maxwell element to, that of a sillatory deformation. A sillatory deformation is a very important deformation for the characterization of viscoelastic materials. When we work through the derivation of how a Maxwell element responds to a sillatory deformation, we're going to introduce three new material parameters. A viscous modulus, G double prime, an elastic modulus, G prime, and a complex viscosity, eta star. In practical rheometry, what we find is that the nature of the curves of G prime, G double prime, and complex viscosity as a function of increasing angular frequency gives us a lot of information from which we can derive relaxation time spectra for real systems. So there's a hint of where we go with Maxwell in future lectures. We're going to put many Maxwell elements together, but we're still, for now, going to concentrate on one Maxwell element. So we're going to start off by reminding ourselves of the setup for the rotational rheometry device that we're using. So here on the blackboard, we have a parallel plate system in a rotational rheometer. Our top plate is fixed and stationary, and we measure the torque development on that plate. Our bottom plate is being moved in an oscillatory manner. And if we think about the motion that we have, we're starting from a start position. We're moving the plate away from the start position, back to the start position, away from the start position in the opposite sense, and then back to the start position again. And so we can describe this very capably by an oscillatory strain. So here now on the blackboard is a graph of my oscillatory strain. I've normalized the curve with my maximum strain, gamma zero, and I can see I've got an arbitrary angular frequency. So if we think of the strain, let's think about the strain rate, gamma dot. Gamma dot is simply going to be the differential of the strain curve. So if we assume that the form of my strain curve is gamma of t is gamma zero sine omega t, then gamma dot of t is going to be simply the differential of that expression. Now, let's just think of that strain expression gamma zero sine omega t again. That can be considered to be the imaginary part of gamma zero e to the i omega t. Remember the complex number formulation that gives us the trigonometric functions from an exponential of an imaginary number. Now, as we develop the analysis for the mechanical response and oscillatory motion further, the complex number formulation is actually a lot easier to deal with and a lot cleaner. So we're going to introduce both the trigonometric function and the complex number function corresponding to the strain and the strain rate and the stress. But when we do our deformation analysis, we'll use solely the imaginary forms, the complex numbers, because it's just easier. So let's think about strain rate. We said the strain rate is going to be the differential with respect to time of strain. And so there on the graph is what the form of the curve will look like. It's in antiphase, if you like, to our strain curve. And of course, gamma dot of t is going to be a cos function. And there we have as well the complex number form that it would take. Now let's think of what we measure on the top plate. We have a torque, an oscillatory torque on that top plate, which knowing the plate geometry, we can convert to a stress. We're going to measure, therefore, an oscillatory stress. The thing of interest, however, is what the phase lag is from the applied strain. Because if we think about the following, then we can see that elastic materials, here's my elastic TheraBand again, my physiotherapy torture device. If I think about the stress in this, as I deform this in an oscillatory manner, the stress is at a maximum here when my strain is at a maximum. When my strain is zero, my stress is zero. And so my stress is completely in phase with my strain. OK. Here's my viscous device, my bicycle pump. Let's think again about stress and strain, not strain rate, strain. So here I have a given strain. That might be my datum strain. I'm going to move away from my datum strain. My stress is zero. My stress was only non-zero when I was moving. 
I'm going to move back to my datum strain. I've taken the stress required to do that. I'm um, stress is zero at my datum strain again, and then move in the opposite sense. Stress zero at maximum strain. Stress non-zero when I have a strain rate. So my viscous response is in antiphase to my strain. It's proportional to my strain rate. And so when we have the stress expression there on the bottom of the blackboard, tau of t is tau naught sine omega t plus delta, where delta is the phase difference between my measured stress and my applied strain, we can start to think about which bit of the stress is in phase with the applied strain, because the bit of the stress that's in phase with the applied strain is going to be due to elastic components, and the bit of the stress that's in antiphase to the applied strain, or in phase with my strain rate, is going to be due to viscous components. Tau zero sine omega t plus delta is of course equal to the imaginary part of tau naught e to the i omega t plus delta. Remember that. So, there on the blackboard is a reminder of our stress response to an oscillation. We've got tau naught sine omega t plus delta. Now, we know that sine a plus b we can write as sine cos plus cos sine. So sine omega t plus delta is sine omega t cos delta plus cos omega t sine delta. Now we're separating these two parts out because it's very useful. Remember we said that the stress that is in phase with the strain is elastic and the stress that is in antiphase with the strain is viscous. So by separating out sine omega t plus delta, we get the two parts that are in phase with our stress, with our strain, and in phase with our strain rate. So if we remind ourselves that our applied strain is the sine form, gamma naught sine omega t. So any bit of stress that is with sine omega t, and we can see there in blue we've got tau naught sine omega t cos delta, that is the elastic contribution. If we remember our strain rate expression, it was a cos form, gamma naught omega cos omega t. And so the stress that is in phase with the strain rate, so tau naught cos omega t sine delta, is due to the viscous part of the Maxwell element. OK, so we can very neatly see the viscous contribution and the elastic contribution to the stray stress. So if we consider that expanded form, stress as a function of time equals tau naught sine omega t cos delta plus cos omega t sine delta. Let's have a look at the bit that's in phase with strain. So the bit in blue there, sine omega t. We can group together the other parameters, the cos delta, the tau naught, and we're going to normalise with a strain, gamma naught, we'll see why in a minute. We can group those parameters together to give us a material property that tells us about the elasticity, which is what we call our elastic modulus sometimes called our storage modulus, because don't forget that a spring will store energy. So G prime is the elastic modulus. Let's have a look at the viscous component. We said that the viscous component of stress is going to be in phase with the strain rate. And we can see there in orange, we've got the cos omega t sine delta form. And so we have another modulus, our viscous modulus, which is simply the tau naught sine delta again normalised with gamma zero, giving us the viscous characterisation. So we have two parameters. We have our viscous modulus and we have our elastic modulus. The easy way to remember which is which is that the one dash has the word that starts with the letter closest to the beginning of the alphabet, E, and the two dashes has the description with the letter that starts furthest away from the start of the alphabet, V. So G prime, elastic, G double prime, viscous. OK, so now we can write our stress expression in terms of our new material parameters. So my time dependent stress, tau of t, is G prime gamma zero sine omega t in phase with my strain, plus G double prime gamma naught cos omega t in phase with my strain rate. 
and on the line below that I've reminded you what the equivalent complex number formulation is that would give rise to that expression. So tau of t is the imaginary part of g prime plus i g double prime gamma naught e to the i omega t. And if we think about it, let's expand out the uh, section there. So e to the i omega t is cos omega t plus i sine omega t. So if we think about g prime gamma naught cos omega t, that's real. OK, so we don't want that. But i g double prime gamma naught cos omega t is imaginary. Fine. So there we have the viscous component. And consequently, if we think about how the two imaginary numbers multiply together to give us a real number, we discard that. The remainder gives us our elastic g prime, which is in phase with my strain. So there's my complex number formulation. Right. Let's see what happens when we substitute the expression for strain rate and stress into my Maxwell mechanical model. So there's my Maxwell mechanical model. Now let's make some substitutions. Now I've coloured the bits that we're substituting. So we've got gamma dot in green, which is on the left hand side. We've got tau stress in white on the right hand side. And now I've used the complex number formulation for both strain rate and for stress. And we end up with this expression. It spans two lines on my blackboard now. There's lots of common terms. So let's get rid of common factors. Our common factor is gamma naught e to the i omega t. And when we get rid of those common factors, we can see that we have a far simpler expression that gives us on the left hand side a strain rate and on the right hand side the stress components. So what we're now going to do is to figure out how g prime and g double prime can be made up of Maxwell parameters. So there's our expression for stress as a function of time. What we're going to do to start with is look at the imaginary parts of this expression and compare imaginary parts. On the left hand side we have imaginary parts of omega g. On the right hand side the first bracket gives us an imaginary part of omega g prime. We can see that we've got i omega times g prime, that's imaginary, i omega times ig double prime, that's going to give us minus omega g double prime, which is real, so we discard that. So second term is far simpler. We have the imaginary component, which is g double prime over lambda. So there is one expression with two unknowns. Of course, even though we've derived this just by looking at imaginary parts, we can look at the real parts in this equation and equate them as well. So let's do that. On the left hand side, there are no real parts. It's entirely imaginary. On the right hand side, if we examine the first bracket, our real part comes from the multiplication of the two imaginary terms. So we've got the i squared there, which is minus one. So we've got minus omega g double prime. And the second term on the right hand side is just simply real with g prime over lambda. So there are two equations and two unknowns, our unknowns being g double prime and g prime. Let's cross substitute and work out that we have g prime, our elastic modulus, is g omega squared lambda squared over one plus omega squared lambda squared. g double prime is g omega lambda over one plus omega squared lambda squared. So there we go. There are our two material properties related to Maxwell parameters. So if we can measure those properties, we can then infer what our Maxwell lambda is. Now, let's see what else we can do. We can derive something that looks like a viscosity. G prime, G double prime are moduli, units of Pascal. Units of angular frequency, radians per second, so there's a per second term there. And so if we look at that quotient that we've put on the board, we'll see that we have units of Pascal second. So this is the resistance to flow, complex viscosity, for a oscillatory motion of a Maxwell element. It's not the same as the resistance to flow in steady shear. So complex viscosity eta star is different from shear viscosity eta. We'll discuss the differences and similarities in a future lecture. Now, as we did with the Maxwell stress decay response, let's have a look at the oscillatory response's limits. So as omega tends to zero, my elastic modulus g prime tends to zero. 
if omega tends to infinity, g prime tends towards the spring modulus g. Okay, so with increasing frequency, the response of the Maxwell element gets increasingly elastic until at infinite frequency it is the modulus of the spring. Okay, my viscous modulus g double prime at low frequency as omega tends to zero, g double prime tends to zero, my viscous modulus tends to zero. If we look at the high limit as omega tends to infinity, g double prime is also zero. So we need to plot out the form of g prime to understand how viscous modulus changes with angular frequency. Okay. Complex viscosity, as omega tends to zero, the limit of the expression for complex viscosity tends to g lambda. As complex viscosity looks at the other limit, we, as omega tends to infinity, then we can see that complex viscosity tends to zero. So we have a decay of complex viscosity that might look a little bit like shear thinning. But remember, this is a deformation, the resistance to deformation of an oscillatory deformation, not the resistance to a steady deformation. This is not shear viscosity. So let's have a look at a graph of g prime, g double prime and eta star as a function of angular frequency. Here is g prime, my elastic modulus. It starts at zero and it increases to a plateau. My viscous modulus, g double prime, starts at zero and ends at zero, but rises and falls. My complex viscosity, eta star, starts at a plateau and then appears to, shear, to thin with increasing angular frequency. It looks like shear thinning, but it's not shear thinning, because remember we're plotting against an axis of angular frequency, not angular velocity. This is all around oscillatory response. So, again, our comment is that it's hard to fit real data with just a single relaxation time when g prime and g double prime. We'll find that g prime and g double prime need more data to fit real materials. Again, if we think about the derivation of our Maxwell element, we said the frame of reference was really important. We just looked in a Lagrangian sense at our Maxwell element, not an Eulerian sense. And so if we're doing oscillatory experiments, we need to keep the displacement strain small in order for this analysis to apply. So let's recap some key points. We've looked at the response of a single Maxwell element to an oscillatory deformation. We've introduced three new material parameters that are capable of describing the Maxwell element response. We have our elastic modulus, g prime, our viscous modulus, g double prime, and our complex viscosity, eta star. We've seen that with a oscillatory motion, when we're looking at phase differences, complex numbers are a very useful compact notation to use, and I encourage you to use that in your derivations. Let's recap what's wrong with Maxwell, because we're going to, in future lectures, extend Maxwell. Maxwell predicts Newtonian viscosity and shear flow. We're going to mend that. Maxwell, on its own, with a single relaxation time, can't fit real data very well. We're going to fix that. Because of our frame of reference with which we derived Maxwell, we've said that at the moment we're limited to looking at small deformations. We'll fix that too in future lectures.